It's the summer of 1950, and at the U.S. government laboratory in Los Alamos, New Mexico, scientists are breaking for lunch. Five years earlier, this was the home of the Manhattan Project, the top secret effort to build the first atomic bomb. But now, in a lighter moment, the discussion at one table has turned to flying saucers. It begins with a humorous story involving aliens. But soon the scientists are debating when it might be possible to travel to the stars. Among those present is Enrico Fermi, a Nobel Prize winning physicist whose many contributions included developing the world's first working nuclear reactor. After a while, the conversation turns to more earthly topics. Then, out of the blue, Fermi suddenly blurts out a question. Where is everybody? Fermi was still thinking about extraterrestrials, and he had just realized that something wasn't right. Fermi then did some quick calculations on the spot that confirmed his suspicions. If there were advanced extraterrestrial civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy, it's likely we would have picked up some sign of them by now. Maybe signs of several civilizations. The fact that it hasn't happened is now called the Fermi Paradox, after the man who posed the question. Fermi wasn't the first person to wonder why we haven't yet seen any signs of alien life in the universe. But as a gifted scientist, he framed the problem in a way that would resonate far beyond that lunchtime conversation. Over six decades later, the Fermi paradox remains unsolved, even as the evidence has mounted that the basic ingredients for life, including carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, are among the most common elements in the galaxy. Astronomers have also discovered hundreds of planets beyond our solar system and directly observed the swirling disks around young stars where new planets are forming right now. All of these new data continue to suggest that if life happened once, right here, it must have happened many times, increasing our chances of contacting an advanced civilization. This optimistic reasoning is further bolstered by the fact that life on Earth has a long history. We know from fossils that over the eons, many different kinds of creatures have called this world home and that evolution has been very effective at ensuring that life continues to adapt and flourish with changing conditions. The earliest traces of life come not from fossils, but from microscopic patterns and chemical traces in ancient rocks. These show that bacteria were already living on our planet at least as early as 3.5 billion years ago. And that means the first cells and the first DNA must date back even earlier. Earth itself is no more than 4.6 billion years old. That's how long ago it formed, along with the other planets, out of the leftover debris that surrounded an infant sun. After allowing a few hundred million years for Earth's surface to cool and its atmosphere to stabilize, it seems that life must have appeared here almost as soon as it was possible to do so. The key ingredient was water. In liquid form, water is an ideal solvent where molecules that are important to biology can interact and react. Because of the early and sustained presence of liquid water, life was able to gain a foothold on Earth. And it may be that Earth was not alone. In 
August 2012, NASA's Curiosity rover landed at Gale Crater on Mars. Over the next several months, as it meandered along the crater's dusty floor, Curiosity found convincing evidence that the rock beneath its wheels had formed in standing water. The presence of clay minerals in the rock suggests that the water was similar to fresh water on Earth and hospitable for life. That's a long way from showing that there once was life on Mars, but it does mean that for some period of time in the remote past, Mars was a livable planet, at least livable for microorganisms. Some suspect there could still be Martian life today, eking out an existence deep underground. So in our own solar system, it appears life arose in one or possibly both of the places where there was an environment that could sustain it. Even if Mars is a dead world, that's a 50% score. And in a galaxy filled with billions of planets, it's hard to imagine that life hasn't been equally successful out there among the stars. But as Fermi realized, there must be a hitch. Perhaps it was only a matter of looking for ET in the right way. By peering deep into the universe, astronomers have come face to face with the immensity of time. Observations of distant galaxies reveal that we live in an expanding universe. By measuring the rate of the expansion, cosmologists now estimate our universe began with an event called the Big Bang, which took place some 13.8 billion years ago. Our deepest views of the cosmos also reveal that by half a billion years after the Big Bang, the formation of stars and galaxies was well underway. If so, our own galaxy probably started forming about that time. In contrast, our solar system is less than five billion years old. It has been around for less than half the age of the Milky Way. This would seem to suggest that there has been plenty of time for other civilizations to arise within the Milky Way long before our own. So when it comes to finding someone else out there that we can talk to, time should be on our side. Instead, we have the Fermi paradox, the startling puzzle that asks, if life is so abundant on Earth, and if the galaxy has been around for such a long time, why have we not yet seen any sign of anyone out there? In 1950, Fermi's question was originally triggered by a conversation among physicists about traveling to the stars. But even if interstellar travel is impossible or impractical because of the great distances involved, the Fermi paradox still holds. That's because the technology already exists to probe the galaxy for radio signals from extraterrestrials. Around the time that Fermi asked his famous question, astronomers were already planning the construction of giant radio dishes to probe the heavens. For the first time in history, humanity had an ear on the cosmos. By 1960, American astronomer Frank Drake was using a 26-meter dish in Greenbank, West Virginia to listen for any radio emissions that might be coming from alien civilizations. It was the beginning of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Drake was not expecting to hear a message specifically meant for us, but he knew Earth was sending out plenty of signals in the form of commercial broadcasts and military radar. 
a civilization even slightly more advanced than our own might be giving off far more. Right from the start, SETI presented a huge needle in the haystack problem. It was one thing to have the right sort of antenna for listening in on ET, but quite another to know where to point it and which of the billions of possible frequencies to listen to. Drake's approach was to point at a couple of the nearest stars that seemed similar to our sun and to choose frequencies near 1420 megahertz, the frequency of radio waves emitted by hydrogen, the most common atom in the universe. When Frank Drake began his search, enthusiasm for SETI was building. Since no one had looked before, it was possible that the skies would turn out to be flooded with signals from well-established civilizations all talking to each other in a galactic social network. Maybe the answer to the Fermi paradox was simply a matter of switching on a radio receiver. But that's not what happened. Drake's initial search came up empty. And so has every subsequent effort to pick up alien radio signals, at least so far. Among the most extensive was Project Phoenix, which used radio dishes in Australia and the United States to probe some 800 carefully chosen star systems. After the project wrapped up in 2004, scientists concluded that if an advanced civilization was using radio transmission to announce its presence anywhere within 200 light years of Earth, we would have discovered it by now. In comparison, the Milky Way is more than 100,000 light years across, so there's still plenty of galaxy left to search. But our ability to gather and sift through radio signals from space is rapidly growing more efficient, driven mainly by Moore's Law, which projects a doubling in computer processing speed about every 18 months. In California, scientists at the SETI Institute are developing the Allen Telescope Array to vastly improve the speed and volume of radio-based searches. If technology continues to improve at its current rate, then by the middle of this century, humans will have listened in on more than one million star systems. If no alien civilization turns up by then, Fermi's paradox will be a more pressing problem than ever. And we'll be left to consider why the chemical and biological processes that led to our emergence has not been repeated elsewhere, or at least not often enough for us to find anyone out there to talk to. Our existence on Earth proves that life is possible in the universe. What it doesn't tell us is how probable life is. For four years, starting in 2009, NASA's Kepler spacecraft found evidence for thousands of planets in the small section of the sky where it trained its gaze. Although many of these finds still need to be confirmed with follow-up observations, the numbers suggest that across the Milky Way, there are tens of billions of planets similar in size to Earth. But we also know there cannot be billions of civilizations out there trying to make contact with us, or we would have heard from some of them already. Where are they is the way Enrico Fermi once framed the question. Given the potential for so many civilizations in our galaxy, is it really plausible that we could be alone? Over the decades since Fermi posed his famous paradox, there have been many attempts to resolve it. 
One set of explanations explores the possibility that extraterrestrials exist, but that they either can't or won't communicate with us. For example, there may be intelligent life on other planets without advanced technology, or in an environment, perhaps underwater, where radio communication is not practical. We may also be overestimating the interest that alien civilizations may have in contacting us. As societies become more advanced, perhaps they also become more inward-looking. Some have suggested that aliens are well aware of us, but they're monitoring us quietly, like scientists studying another species in their natural setting. The trouble with all these speculations is that for every society we can imagine that doesn't want to say hello for some reason, we can also imagine others that do. For us, curiosity and communication have come with huge survival benefits. The more information we can gather about our environment, the better we can prepare for unknown threats or take advantage of resources that come our way. It stands to reason that at least some extraterrestrial civilizations must be curious and interested in communicating. We can even imagine that such a civilization would be sending probes out to the stars. In 2013, Voyager 1 became the first human-made probe to reach the edge of the solar system and cross into interstellar space. With a few centuries of improvements to our technology, we could be sending much faster and more sophisticated probes to the stars. These probes could be equipped with instructions for how to find a moon or asteroid with suitable resources for the probes to make copies of themselves that would be sent to explore further. The idea of a self-replicating machine was first suggested by the mathematician and computer science pioneer John von Neumann. If such machines could be built to travel through space at 1 40th the speed of light, about 400 times faster than Voyager 1, after a few million years, they would have visited every star system in the Milky Way. But that's just the blink of an eye in the lifetime of our planet. The fact that we have found no evidence for von Neumann machines in our solar system suggests that no one has ever built them, which in turn means that there can't be many advanced civilizations out there, or someone would have done it by now. This kind of reasoning has focused attention on the history of life on our world, and the remarkable chain of coincidences that has given our species virtual mastery over our entire planet. Perhaps we are more special than we think. Some have noted that even though life emerged quickly on Earth, complex, multicellular life took billions of years to show up. If a planet can't maintain a stable environment for that long, then maybe the best it can manage is to be home to a world of bacteria. In 2000, astronomer Don Brownlee and paleontologist Peter Ward looked at how many things have to go right to have a planet like Earth. They concluded that while simple life may be very common throughout the universe, complex life is an exception. They called their idea the rare Earth hypothesis, and in the next decade or so, we may have a hint about whether they're right. Following on from the Kepler mission, scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology are now developing the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS for short. Its goal will be to spot Earth-like planets crossing in front of nearby stars. If there is life on those planets, even microbial life, follow-up observations may detect traces of it just by analyzing the starlight passing through the planet's atmosphere. If TESS turns up planets that may be hospitable to bacteria, but nothing more, then we may indeed be living in a rare Earth kind of universe.
Of course, there is one more way of resolving the Fermi paradox, and that is to consider that the technology needed to make contact with another civilization may go hand in hand with the technology that would allow a civilization to self-destruct. So far, we've managed to avoid blowing ourselves up. But given the increasing pressure we're putting on our planet, it's fair to say our survival is far from guaranteed. One of the great ironies of the Fermi paradox is that it came up in a conversation between brilliant scientists working in a military lab at the height of the Cold War. That should remind us that the paradox is not just a curious quirk of the cosmos, but an important caution for our entire civilization. If nothing else, Fermi's paradox tells us that long-lasting civilizations may be exceptionally rare, and that it will take great perseverance on our part if we are to become one of them. If we succeed, and then we do one day pick up a message from another intelligent species, we will have double reason to celebrate. It will mean that we're not alone, and that thanks to our careful self-preservation, neither are they. <laughs>